<laughs> Any questions about anything before we get going? Do you have office hours today? I can I can be available to meet today without any issues. If you just uh, let me know what time you want to meet. I have a meeting with a prospective student at 3, but other than that, I'm pretty available. Okay. I just don't know what like, your other class schedule looks like. I have, uh, I've got a uh, class at 11. I guess I should have said that, too. So afternoon, I should, <laughs> should have specified. Afternoon, I'm free. <clears throat> other questions at all? Pardon me. Sorry. What was that? Your audio was going out. Oh, I I coughed. <laughs> so, you know, see what happens here. All right. So I th I meant to post a solution to this problem. Uh, it was the second one that I was going to do last time, and I believe I forgot to post it on Moodle. Now that I'm thinking about it, because I got busy doing a bunch of other things yesterday as well. So this was the second one of the sequence that we started, or, uh, sorry, of the problems that we were doing at the end of class last time, which was talking about that if we know what a linear transformation does to a basis, then we know what the linear transformation does. So this is, um, I'm just going to talk through it since I already have it written down anyway, but this is number 15 on page 398. And I will post this on Moodle as well. I'll get that done today. I just had forgotten to do it uh, yesterday. So you're given a basis. So the V1, V2, V3 here is a basis for R3. And if you wanted to check that it was a basis, you could do what we've always done, put it in a matrix as columns, each vector as, col as a column, row reduce, and see that you get the identity matrix. Then they also tell you what the outputs are for each of the basis vectors. So that's what the T of V1, T of V2, and T of V3 all represent. And then it asks us to find basically a rule for the T of XYZ, and then use the rule to find what T of 7, 13, 7 is. <clears throat> okay. So this is where we make use of the fact that we have a basis is in the fact that any x, y, z here, any x, y, z that we have in R3 can be written as a linear combination of the three basis vectors that we have. So I have the C1 times the first one, C2 times the second one, C3 times the third one. From that linear combination, we can set up a system of linear equations. So that system of linear equations here, the first equation, this equation, is just coming from the fact that we're equating the first components together. <clears throat> and then the second equation is from the second components, and the third equation is from the third components. So remember, the way we're trying to go with this is that we're given the x, y, z, and we're trying to find the constants. <clears throat> so that's why I set up the system of equations and want to try to solve that system. <clears throat> oh, that's interesting. Seriously? Sorry about that. How much of that did you miss? Uh, it kind of just cut out suddenly for me. Okay. You're, you're, uh, I, I can hear everything you're saying. Uh, it's not, but it's like, it's all a little scratchy for some reason. Okay. That's like everything's coming through, but it's it's coming through kind of choppy. Yeah, I yeah I don't know what the deal is this morning. <laughs> All right, so let's try to go back to this again. <laughs> I'd really rather not have to uh, 
record a lecture here, but <laughs> this is going to be a pain. I guess I'll have to. Uh, anyway, so did, I, did everybody catch me talking about setting up the system of equations? Yeah, I got that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so again, we're given the x, y, z, and we're trying to find the constants. We're trying to find that linear combination that gives us the vector x, y, z. So instead of trying to, if we had a computer algebra system, I would probably just pop it into the computer algebra system and let it solve it. But we don't have a computer algebra system typically. I mean, if you've got a TI-89 or one of the inspires that does it, <clears throat> I would just have you pop it in there and do it. But since we don't have that, the easiest way to do that with your TI-84 is we set this up as a matrix equation <clears throat> and then find the inverse of the matrix and then multiply it by the x, y, z because with the, uh, the TI-84s, we can do the inverses on there. So if you type in this 1, 2, 3, 2, 9, 3, 1, 0, 4 and do its inverse, you'll get that matrix that's below. And that is an ugly looking 5. And then this last part here, all I did was multiply the matrices together. So just took the, the first row times the column and so on down the line. So we're almost there, not quite there. So remember, the whole point of doing this is trying to find a rule so that if you know what x, y, z is, you can just plug it into the function and evaluate it and be done with it. So... What we've found so far are just, remember, this is your C1, your C2, and your C3. So what we're doing from there is we're going to plug it back into our linear combination. So back up at this line. You can imagine plugging those C values in. And then I'm going to apply the transformation to both sides. So that's what this line is. That's applying the transformation to both sides to that first starred line. And what we're using there is the properties that linear transformations break up over sums. And you can pull constants out you can pull constants out of the transformation in front. So if we're given x, y, z, then that thir negative 36x plus 8y plus 21z is a constant. So we can pull it out in front. So all we're doing there is just applying the linear transformation and pulling the constants out. And then for these three, you're given the values. You're given what the transformation does to 1, 2, 1, and the 2, 9, 0, and the 3, 3, 4. So all the next step is is just plugging in those outputs. And then finally, the last step is just... Uh, last step is just simplifying that expression. So put, getting your first components and getting your second components. So now this part here is your rule for t of x, y, z. So quite a bit of work to get to that point, but that's what that is. And then finally, the last part just asks you to use the rule to get the evaluation of t of 7, 13, 7. So that's just a matter of plugging in the 7 for x, the 13 for y, and the 7 for z, and getting the, the numbers, the negative 2 and the 3. So the process is a little clunky. I agree that it's a little bit clunky, but... Since we know, the whole point of this is since we know what the transformation does with the basis, we know what the transformation does, period. It doesn't matter 
at that point, it doesn't matter what other information you're given. As soon as you're given the information about what the transformation does to the basis, you've got everything that you need to know to be able to figure out the transformation. And that's really what this whole exercise was about that I put the red box around. We had enough information to figure out the entire transformation. Any questions on that at all? Okay, so the last part of this, and we're going to come back to this some too uh, as we go into the next section that I, well, I'm skipping ahead to, but then coming back, uh, talking a little bit of that into the next section as well, and that's just the idea of composition. You've done compositions of functions before, so composition of linear transformation is not any different than composition of functions, and the reason for that is, of course, that linear transformations are functions. They just are special kinds of functions that satisfy a couple of properties. So when you do the composition, if I do T1, oh sorry, let me write it this way, T2 composed with T1 of a vector, I'll call it U since I used U for the first domain, you already know how to do this from algebra class before this algebra class, you know that that's T2 of T1 of the input. And we notice now that this new transformation that we made from the composition has a domain of U and a codomain of W. So V is kind of an intermediary, if you will. So let's see if we can just do a couple of examples here. So let's look at this first one where we've got T1 is taking a vector in R2 to a vector in R3. So T, I'll just write that out separately. We see that T2 goes from r2 to r3 and we see that t2 goes from r3 to r2 all right so uh, let's look at just doing the composition like it asked us to do before so and then we're going to look at the matrices of these transformations, see if we can figure out the matrices, because we're going to talk about that in a little bit too. But we've already talked a little bit about doing matrices for uh, the transformations for uh, R and Rm. But according to the definition, if I want the T2 of T1 of a vector, then I do, or T2 composed of T1 of the vector, I want to do T2 of T1 of the vector. Well, the vector that's going into T1 is a vector in R2. So it's T2 of T, uh, it's going to be T2 composed with T1 of the XY. So then the definition says that that's T2 of T1 of XY. And we know what T1 of XY is. It's 2X, negative 3Y, and X plus Y. We're already given that output. And now we can put this into T2. So notice our X here is really 2X. Our Y here is really negative 3Y and our z is x plus y. So when I do this, we get 2x minus a negative 3y. And then in the second component, you get a negative 3y plus x plus y. And I'll just simplify there a little bit at the end to get the 2x plus 3y. The video comma. is like a couple seconds behind what you're saying. Oh, the video is? Now it just pops up with the 2x. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah. That's probably a little confusing this morning, isn't it? Is everything on the screen now? Because I haven't written for a while. Oh, nope, kick me off. <sighs> kick me off again. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Everybody see my screen again? Can you hear me? It hasn't popped. Yeah, it's, it's, it's starting. It it's... hasn't popped up yet. It says you started screen sharing. Oh, okay. Oh, goodness. Well, I'll give this one more shot, and if I cut out again, I'm just going to have to record the rest of the lecture, because this is clearly going really well for everybody right now. Um, in case it does cut out a little right. bit. Does somebody say something? I'm sorry. Sorry, I said the screen's up now. Oh, the screen's up now. Thank you. <laughs> In case we do get cut off again, I did want to say a little bit about the test on Friday, just to remind about the test on Friday. So um, remember that the in-class portion, if you will, will be that computational piece that I talked about um, a couple of uh, a couple of class periods ago. I will send an email out to everybody reminding about uh, the types of computational problems that I'll expect you to do. And again, I want you to use your technology. I mean, I want you to write out what you're doing. So, for example, uh, one of the things that I showed you how to do was solve the characteristic equation uh, when you're solving for eigenvalues and using your calculator, using that determinant of A minus X times the identity matrix and graphing it to figure out where the roots are. I want you to use that on the exam so you're not spending all this time trying to take the determinant and pre and multiply things out and refactor because that takes a long time i want you i want you to use the technology if you need to because you don't have the ti-84 remember that uh, i sent you a link that uh, you can download an emulator for your computer so that you can be able to use the 84 that way if you need me to resend that please tell me but uh like I said, I'll send an email reminding everybody the types of computational problems that I'll expect you to do on the exam and that the take home should already be up. Gosh darn it. All right, so let me try to finish off this lecture so that you can actually watch the rest of it for uh, understanding what's going on. I apologize for the internet issues. I wish I knew how to, it's a good solution for my home internet issues, but I don't have one right now, so I got what we got. Sorry. So, all right, so I wanted to talk about this particular composition of the transformations and how we could write the matrix of these. So we know that the composition of the functions t1 or t2 composed with t1 the domain of t1 is r2 so that's the domain of the composition the codomain of t2 is r also r2 so that's the codomain for the composition so if we want to write the matrix for this we talked about this before so we use brackets and you probably recognize that we use the brackets from the video that i asked you to watch for today we use brackets around the composition here, and uh, we could write across the rows the coefficients that we have. So the first row here is a 2 and a 3 for the 2x plus the 3y, and the second row here is the negative or 1 and the negative 2. And we can just to double check that this really does work, we'll go over to the side here. When we do the matrix multiplication, remember we want things to line up. So we think about the x, y being a column vector. 
the two matches with the x, the three matches with the y, we get the 2x plus 3y for that first component. The one matches with the x, the negative two matches with the y. We get that second component. Okay. Uh, again, notice that when we do these matrices, the number of rows comes from the, the dimension of the codomain space, the two here. The number of columns comes from the domain space. All right, so one of the things I want to notice is that if I look at the matrices for T1 and T2 individually, let's see what happens. So the matrix for the T1 should be a 3 by 2 matrix. And then again, we go across the rows with the entries here. So the first component is a 2x, and then there's no y. So I would have 2, 0 for the first row. No x is in a negative 3y, 0, negative 3. But 1x and 1y, so 1, 1 for that matrix. And notice again, it's a 3 by 2. T now should be a 2 by 3 matrix. And again, going across the rows, first row will be a 1, negative 1, 0. Second row will be a 0, 1, 1. So now if I want the, uh, one of the, what I want to notice here is if I take the, if I want the matrix T2 composed with T1, we can get this very easily if I already know the individual matrices. So just to go off to the side here, we had our matrix for T was two, or sorry, T1 was two, zero, zero, negative three, one, one. This was the T1. And here's my T2 over here. If I take the T, so remember, I'm thinking about this being multiplied by the X, Y. So this is my input and this is the function applying to the input, right? Well, this would be the inside then of the T2. So if I go over here, I'm gonna erase this a little bit. If I go over here and put my T2, this should give me the same output, right? Cause I'm thinking about this being the this is my input. The matrix multiplication gives me the output for T1. Now, if I take that and put it into T2, I should get my composition. So now if we multiply our matrices together, notice that if you take the one times the two, gives me two, negative one times zero is zero, zero times one is zero, I get two. One times zero, negative one times three, negative three, zero times one, I get a three, and so on down the line. I really do get that same matrix back that we had before. These two things are the same. So we notice that the matrix for the composition is the product of the matrices. And again, one of the reasons why I wanted to mention this is because what we're going to talk about here in a little bit, we're going to talk about finding the matrices for general transformations. It's kind of cool that you can get the matrix for the composition by doing the multiplication of matrices that's kind of a nice result. Uh, let's see if we can work the other way around. Notice that we have T2 composed with T1. We could have also done T1 composed with T2. So I don't have a lot of space here. So I'll do it up over here so I can still see. Good news is that you can pause things on video and if I move something, you can pause and rewind and go back and catch it if you need to write it down while I'm still talking. All right, so let's look at T1 composed with T2. Okay, so if I think of that just as a function, this is gonna go from R3 because that's the input space for T2. So that's gonna be the input for the comp composition. And it's also gonna go to R3 because that's the output space for the T1. So if I wanna find the matrix for T1 composed with T2 now, according to what we just talked about, I should be able to find it by doing T1 times the T2, matri the matrix for T1 times the matrix for T2. The matrix for T1 was the 2, 0, 0, negative 3, 1, 1. And the matrix for T2 was 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. 
if we do that multiplication now, two times the one, and then plus the zero times zero gives me two. Uh, negative two plus zero is negative two. Zero plus zero is zero, that's the first row. Do the second row, we get zero, negative three, negative three. And do the third row, we get one, zero, one. And we really do get a three by three matrix, which makes sense for how the composition is defined here. What helps us with this is now if we wanted a rule for this, all I need to do is, well, I can see what the rule is. Sorry, I don't even need to write out the matrix multiplication. Because if I put a, an x, y, z on the right hand side here, then I would take this row times that column. So if I want T1 composed with T2 of x, y, z, the first component would just be 2x minus 2y, reading across the row. The second component would be negative 3y minus 3z. And the third component would be x plus z. And so this would be your composition of the two functions in the other order. And you should go back through and check it if you actually went through with the rules that they give you and do t1 of t2 of x, y, z, you should get the same rule that we came up here using the matrices. All right, let's do another example before, eh, we'll do a couple more examples here. So um, let's look at this first one. T1 is defined by do, uh, taking the matrix and mapping it to its trace. The second one is defined by taking a matrix and doing its transpose. This one asks for T1 of T2. So if I do that in this case, we'll just do the, the formula. We won't worry about the matrices because we haven't talked about matrices for general transformations yet. And this would be a general transformation. So this would be T1 of T2 of the matrix. The T2 function is transpose, so we would take the transpose. And the T1 function is the trace, so we add the diagonal to get the trace. So that would give me A plus D in this case. The problem then asks, can you do T2 composed with T1? Well, T2 is this matrix to matrix. And T1 is matrix to real number. So can I do T2 composed with T1? Well, think about it. The input has to go into T1. So it has to come from M22. But the output is an R. Then we take this output and try to put it into the input for T2. That doesn't work. So the answer to, can you find T2 of T1 of A? The answer is no, this doesn't exist. And the reason for this is because the codomain of T1, where the outputs of T1 live, is not a subset of the domain of T2. If it comes out of T1, that's what it means to be in the codomain. If it comes out of T1, it has to go into T2. In this case, we don't have that scenario. So, all right. So that tells us that that composition is not defined. Okay, let's do one more because this one's a, more of a calculus review than anything. So the first one says differentiation is your first transformation and integration is your second one. And it asks, let's see if we can do the composition if we have those three particular functions. All right, so the first one says integrate first and then differentiate. So if we want decompose with i of x squared plus 3x plus 2, that says we want to take the derivative of the integral of the function.
Well, we know from fundamental, oops, let me not write it that way. I shouldn't have written, <laughs> when I typed this up, I should have written this with a T because I've got my variable in two different places. So let me put T's here. So let's say T squared and three T, just as it's bad form to have X in both places. So we know from fundamental theorem of calculus that when I differentiate a function defined as an integral this way, I just end up with the x going in for the t. So I get x squared plus 3x plus 2. So I get the same answer. That was the f of x. If we do the integral, uh, it, oh, sorry, if we do the derivative first and then the integral, and this is of x squared plus 3x plus 2. Notice the first thing we would do is differentiate the polynomial, 2x plus 3. The transformation is integrate the 2x plus 3 from 0 to x. Well, what happens there is we lose the, plus, we lose the constant on the end. Because we, if we integrate this polynomial and put in zero for the lower bit length, uh, for the lower limit of our integral, we're not going to get a constant. It's going to be a zero. So notice we don't end up with the same thing we started with. We did here. If we integrate and then differentiate, we get the same answer. But we get the same thing as we started with, I should say. Well, if we go the other way around, we don't. All right, so you can do the same thing for the other two. And you should be able now to guess what it's going to be. In f of x, since this the, for the second f of x, since there's no constant, you'll get the same answer both times. And in the third one, if you integrate and then differentiate, you'll get the same function. But if you differentiate first, you lose the 3, and you don't get the 3 back when you integrate. So for the last one, if you did decomposed with i, of e to the x plus 3, you'll get e to the x plus 3. But if you integrate and then differentiate, or excuse me, if you differentiate and then integrate, you just get e to the x. You lose the 3. Okay, enough about compositions. Let's switch over to matrices of linear transformations. This to me is the cool part of dealing with linear transformations because what this says is that we can replace any linear transformation. Doesn't matter what it is. Whatever the transformation is, as long as we have a basis for the vector space and for the co the, sorry, for the domain and for the codomain, as long as we have bases for those, we can always do the transformation through matrix multiplication. And that makes computations of linear transformations for arbitrary vector spaces just turn into the computations for what you would do for real vector spaces. Oh, Euclidean vector spaces, I should say. That's the cool part. All right, so how do we form this matrix? Well, the matrix, the notation is B prime comma B, and you make columns. So the first column is the transformation applied to your first basis vector. The second column is the transformation applied to the second basis vector for the inputs, by the way. And then so on down the line. But you have to do this relative to the coordinates that you have, uh, the coordinates relative to the basis that you have for your output space. So when you apply the transformation to each basis vector, it's a vector in W. So each of those has coordinates with respect to the second basis. So you're putting the basis vectors in for into T. Those are the ones coming from the domain space. Once they come out, they're now in the codomain space. So I write their coordinates relative to the uh, basis for the codomain space. This is how we find it. And again, the other, the other video that I asked you to watch for today goes through the process of why this works. Okay. All right, so let's do some examples. And that's literally all I want to do as far as examples go here. Okay, so here's a matrix, T of x, y. I've got two bases, and I want to 
figure out the matrix of this transformation relative to these two bases. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to apply the transformation to each of the basis vectors for the domain. So I'm going to apply the transformation to 1, 3 and negative 2, 4. When I put in 1, 3, I get what? 7 and negative 1, 0. And then when I plug in negative 2, 4, I get, uh, what do I get? I get 6 and I get 2 and I get 0, if I did that correctly. Okay, now I don't, I don't take these immediately and put them in those columns. I have to figure out what the coordinates are of these relative to the other bases. So in this case, I need to solve a system. So I have to find the linear combination of each of the basis vectors that gives me the outputs. And I can do this all at once if I'm clever. Okay, so uh, notice that this tells me, if I look at this right away, I can, I can put it in my calculator, that's fine. But what this tells me is that for the first basis vector, I don't want to use it at all, right? Because this would say the first, the first constant that I want to use, which would be the C1 times that first basis vector, I don't want to do anything to this particular basis vector to give me the second, sorry, to give me either of the vectors that I have because they have zeros in those components, okay? So if I, again, if I think about my C1 for this one, I want the C1 to be zero, right? For that one, for either of the two vectors. That's what that was saying for us. All right, so for the second one, so anyway, let me go back over here. I'm trying to find coordinates of these relative to B prime. This tells me the first coordinate of both of them is going to be zero. All right, so once I know the first coordinate is zero, this says that, because again, this says that C1 is equal to zero and C1 is equal to zero. The other one says it's two C2 then, because I already know that C1 is zero. Two C2 equals negative one for the first one or 2C2 equals 2 for the second one. So I'm basically solving two systems of equations at the same time because all I'm needing to change is the constant that's, uh, that it's equal to. So this one says for the first one, the C2 is negative a half, and for the second one, the C2 is 1. The first, the first row now says that 2C2 plus C3 has to equal 7, and I know that I don't need to worry about the first one because I already said the C1 was 0. And for the second one, it says that 2C2 plus C3 is equal to 6. So now we have both of these equations to solve, but we already know what C2 is. So in the first one, C2 is negative 1, so I get C3 is equal to 8 in that case. Or sorry, C2 is negative a half, so I'll get negative 1 there. So C3 will be 8. In the second case, I'll get C3 is 7, it would appear. So I get 8 for that one and 7 for that one. So our matrix of T relative to B prime comma B will be... 0, negative 1, half, 8, and 0, 1, 7. So that gives us our matrix for that particular transformation relative to those two bases. All right, so again, we could do this for any bases we want, but usually we want to do them for the standard bases. So let's look at this one. All right, so this problem says, let's find t of 1 plus x minus x squared in two different ways. Well, the first way to do it is the direct way. So doing, learning nothing new. This transformation says, plug in x minus 3 into the polynomial and then multiply by x. So this means x times 1 plus, replace the x with x minus 3. And then we'll simplify. So this is x times 
Oh, what do you have? 1 plus x minus 3 minus x squared plus 6x minus 9. So we'll get a negative x cubed, right? And then I've got 7x squared. And then I have, uh, what, minus 11x? If I did that correctly. And I guess the way they have it written here, writing it increasing. You, the reason why we're writing it in an increasing order by degree is because our bases here are given to us by increasing order by degree. So this would be the direct way to solve it, right? Plug it in the x minus 3s and go through and simplify. Let's do it the indirect way, of, or for lack of a better word, or the matrix way to do it. So the first thing we want to do is evaluate the transformation on the basis for b. Well, t of 1, well, p of x minus 3 in that case is 1 times x will just be x. p of x minus 3 will be x minus 3 times x, so that'll be negative 3x plus x squared. For t of x squared, you would have x times, I'll write this one out a little bit, you'll have x times x minus 3 squared. So if we multiply this out, that's x squared minus 6x plus 9, and then multiply it by an x, so you would have a 9x minus 6x squared plus x cubed. Okay, so that's the image of the basis vectors, but now we need to write them as coordinate vectors. So relative to b prime, the x is no ones and x, no x squared, no x cubes. And then similarly for the other ones. I'm just notice I'm just pulling the coefficients off because it's the standard bases here. So the coordinates are easy to find. All right, so our matrix for the transformation then is just take those coordinate vectors and write them down as columns. All right, so if I want to evaluate this polynomial now, the transformation applied to this polynomial, I know that the coordinates of this relative to b prime will be the matrix that we just found times the coordinates of the input relative to b. Well, that's 1, 1, and negative 1, right? It's 1x, 1, or excuse me, 1, 1, 1x, one and no uh, negative x squared. Now, if you multiply this together, you get a 0. 1 minus 3 minus 9 is negative 11. 0 plus 1 plus 6 is 7. And then 0 plus 0 minus 1 is negative 1. Here are my coordinates, and notice then that I get the same answer that I had. Oops. Those are the coordinates, so I get a negative 11x plus 7x squared minus x cubed. And again, this is the whole reason why we want these matrices, so that we can do this, right? So that we can replace doing this computation algebraically with doing this computation arithmetically. That's the whole point. All right, let's do another one. Let's say we have the derivative operator here. So, I mean, just take the derivative, right? So, this one asks us to find the, the matrix of the transformation relative to B. Since it's a linear operator here, it's going from V to itself. If, it, if we have the same basis for both input and output space, we don't write it twice. So again, we want to find the transformation applied to each basis vector. And in this case, the transformation is just the derivative. So I have to use a little bit of product rule here.
and then a little bit of chain rule in it as well. But you should be able to verify should be able to verify that those are the derivatives again using the product rule and the chain rule. Now again, we should write these now as coordinates relative to the bases. Notice that the first one is just the first uh, output here is two times the first one and then neither of the seconds. The second output here is two, one, that's one times the first one. I can't, I can't see. It's one times the first one plus two times the second one. And the third one is none of the first one, two of the second one, and two of the third one. So then our base, excuse me, our matrix for our transformation is going to be two, zero, zero for the first column. 1, 2, 0 for the second column, 0, 2, 2 for the third column. So there's our matrix for the transformation, so that's the first part. For the second part now, it asks us to use the matrix to compute this. Actually, it doesn't say that, but that's what the, it's implied, hopefully. So if I want this, if I want the transformation applied to this function then I want to take this matrix oops I should say coordinates relative to B I want to take this matrix and multiply it then by the coordinates of the input relative to the basis so 2 1 0 0 2 2 0 0 2 times that 4 6 negative 10 and that gives me 8 plus 6 is 14, and 0 plus 12 minus 20, uh, 12 minus 20 is negative 8, and then I get negative 20, whoops, I'm writing it the wrong way, negative 8, negative 20. These are the coordinates, so what this tells us then is that the derivative of this function, oops, this is e to the 2x. Sorry about that. I wrote that wrong to start with. The derivative of this is 14 e to the 2x minus 8x e to the 2x minus 20 e x squared e to the 2x. So notice I just did a little bit of calculus without doing any differentiation on that at all. Okay, so again, the whole point of this is that if I know deri how derivative rules work, and I know the derivatives of some basic functions, I can basically generate all the derivatives that I need, or all the derivatives that I'm trying to compute based on the ones that I know and how derivatives rules work. And this is how, basically, it gives you a little bit of, a, hopefully, an insight into how the computer algebra systems work. So, let's see, I don't think I had any other, oh, I had one more example here, but... Um, I think I'll leave that for me just writing up a solution rather than talking through it, and then you can read through it. So anyway, I apologize for the technical issues again today. Um, I wish I had, like I said, I wish I had a solution for my internet issues. I do not at the current time just by where I live. So uh, anyway, like I said, fr feel free to holler at me if you've got questions, and I will also get things sent out as far as um, things about the exam for... Uh, Friday. So I'll get you an email as well. So talk to you later.